following the seven seals under what symbols was the next series of thrilling events shown the apostle John. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God to them were given seven trumpets. So the question is, what, what are these symbols? What do these trumpets mean? Now, this is the historic view. This is the correct view. And we see on the screen, there's seven trumpets and the first four is blocked off. That's Western Rome. Fifth and sixth is Eastern Rome. And then it says on this chart, the downfall of the world. You can think uh, the downfall in a special way of uh, the United States as the U.S. goes, so do all the other nations. And, and the U.S. is an image to Rome. And been to Washington, D.C., it's even set up like the Roman Forum. And so the seventh trumpet is blowing on the world. It's blowing on the image of the beast. And so there you have it, the first four judgments against Western Rome. Fifth and sixth, downfall of Eastern Rome, and in a special sense, downfall of the United States under the seventh trumpet. Uh, the first was Alaric. The second trumpet was the Vandals. The third was Attila the Hun. The fourth was the collapse of the Roman government. There's a name uh, under the fourth trumpet, too, that you'll see in our publications, Odysseur. The fifth trumpet, this is the constant incursions from the Saracens and the Turks. It's broken up into two five-month periods, one for the Saracen, one for the Turk. So fifth trumpet is Saracen and Turk. Sixth trumpet is Turk. Ottoman Turk cons conquers Constantinople and terrorizes Europe. So one unified Islamic caliphate under the sixth trumpet, whereas under the fifth trumpet, it passes from Umayyad to Abbasid to Turk. So hence, we have Arabs and Turks for the fifth trumpet. And those little details are important. Those little details are all very important as we try to get at new light because new light unfolds out of old light. So we're looking for patterns when trying to understand the third woe, when trying to understand the seventh trumpet, we look to the fifth and sixth trumpet, the first and second Whoa, these the fifth and sixth trumpet have woes embedded in them. The, they're aspects of the trumpets. The first four do not have that. West, the Western Roman Empire was a pagan uh, empire, whereas the Eastern Roman was an, an ecclesiastical power. There, so that's one difference. The other difference is you had Germanic barbarians flooding into the Western Roman Empire. But with the, under the fifth and sixth trumpet, you had Arabs and Mohammedans and Turks flooding into the Roman Empire. So that's another difference too. And those types of people constitute the woe. These, those that are driven by this um, Islamic um, religion. So a trumpet represents what? Numbers 10.9, summons to war. Jeremiah 4.19 says the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. So that's the same thing. There are two witnesses there. Amos 3, 6, shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? So we see God's judgments. 1 Corinthians 4, 8, for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? This is a very fitting symbol for our message here at the end of the world. We need to blow the trumpet. We need to stand on the walls of Zion and blow that trumpet. Because in our message, we are preparing people for a literal battle of Armageddon that's coming upon the world. And so we want people to be ready to be um, to, for their sins for, for them to have repented from their sins so that they're in good standing with God so that they can have angelic protection during this time. Others uh, who have not made use of probationary time while mercy still lingers will be found with it. There will be no intercessor for them to pray to, and they will be dead in their sins. And God's going to remove his hedge of protection from them, remove their guardian angels, and they will fall by the sword. They will fall on the battle of Armageddon. They will they will be destroyed by Christ. Also, when he comes back, Babylon will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. So 
the trumpet is a very fitting symbol for our message and what we're doing. We need to give a more definite message. We do not want our message to have an uncertain sound to it. We need to be all speaking the same thing. It needs to be very clear what we are articulating and what we are saying. Stephen Haskell says, Christ lived and died, and the Christian religion was proclaimed to the world all within the confines of the Roman Empire. Therefore, it is only reasonable to expect that the downfall of Rome, which was so closely connected with the history of Christ's church, should be the subject of prophecy. An important point and something that's very true, when we look at the church in the wilderness and where they existed, where were they? The church in the wilderness was found in northern Alps, and the church in the wilderness is the bridge between the apostolic church, the early church, and the remnant. Look at uh, Revelation 12, 17. The dragon was wroth with the woman and make war with the remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the remnant of the seed of the woman, earlier in the chapter, it explains this is the woman that fled into the wilderness, and we can identify which church that was, what they believed and what their doctrine was. And you'll see that it was groups like the Albigenses, the Waldensians, uh, the church that uh, Colombo founded in Iona. So it's these people that are living in mountainous retreats and on islands and uh, far out places at the edge at the edge of of the of the kingdoms of of Europe the edge of the continent of Europe and and within 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 the, the mountainous regions and the wilderness of Europe and this is former roman territory so on the outskirts of the old roman empire and the reason that this is the case is the church in the East bumped up against Zoroastrianism. It wasn't like a, a, a crude paganism where there was a great contrast between the, the religion of Christ and the uh, and the pagans. There was the line of demarcation was was very clear and broad, but with Zoroastrianism, they didn't have idols. There was there was a concept of the resurrection. There was a concept of atonement. There was a concept of a mediator. There were no idols. When the gospel started to be preached, when this new religion of Christ started to go forth, and the disciples of Christ went eastward, and they bumped up against Zoroastrianism, they 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 each were able to look at each other as counterfeits, because there was a lot of similarities. And this probably had to do with Daniel being in Babylon and things like that. The Eastern countries were able to adopt a, a lot of gospel truths um, because Old Testament prophets um, had been in those regions. But when we go into Western Rome, the religion there was very um, unadulterated paganism with no semblance of truth. And so Christianity was easily able to conquer it. How does Satan get the upper hand? Well, he infiltrates the church through subversion, uh, through the mystery of iniquity, by cloaking paganism, by, bapti by, by baptizing it and cloaking it with a thin veneer of Christianity. Zoroastrianism had already done something similar to that a centuries before, so the church didn't penetrate into the East to this, with the same effect that it penetrated in the West. So, therefore, when we look to the ch when we look to the church in the wilderness, when we look um, to what prophecy has to say, we can see God, we see God's people there in Europe keeping the flame of truth alive down through the centuries. And so it becomes the subject of prophecy. That's why when we look at the trumpets, it's it's, it's judgments against Western Rome and not, let's say, Chinese dynasties or Persian kings or something like that. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto him his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. We see a hierarchy here, God giving, God the Father giving the revelation to Christ Jesus, uh, then him signifying it. 
uh, unto the angel, Gabriel, and then it goes to John, and then it goes to us. So there is a hierarchy in heaven. That's an important point. You can also see this also helps to substantiate the one true God truth. Jesus Christ is receiving something from the Father. The important part for our study, though, is this concept of shortly come to pass. Now, some higher critics will try to say that shortly come to pass doesn't mean shortly come to pass. They're dispensationalists, and they push all the prophecies out into the future. But the, the prophecies shortly come to pass. They start to unfold down through time. So we should see that first trumpet. We should see that first seal. We should see that first church age being uh, unfolding presently in John's era. The first trumpet would be later, but it wouldn't be thousands of years later. It would, it would be shortly come to pass. It'd be a few centuries, and then we were already there with the first trumpet unfolding. We're already there presently with the first church and the first seal. And so likewise, the trumpet is not going to be at the very end of the world. It's also going to unfold down through time. So it's, it's shortly going to come to pass. This judgment is coming. Get ready, church, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Let me say it this way. For the time is at hand. The prophecies are unfolding down through time now. So this is historicism. And we differentiate this from preterism, which all the prophecies of Revelation fulfilled in the apostolic era, and futurism, where all the prophecies happen at the end of the world. Historicism is the only one that makes sense and the only one that has any sort of sanctifying power in it because it's truth. Sanctify them with the truth. Thy word is truth. And historicism unfolds down through time. God's people are always being and always have been directed by the sure word of prophecy, which is the foundation of their faith. God has a message for all of these generations down through time. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, and that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. We're reading from the seven trumpets. We're in verse three now. We're, in the, we're at the beginning of the chapter. And we have a scene of the heavenly sanctuary. Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. We can know where we are in prophecy by where God is in the sanctuary above. And so where is he? he well, he's, he has the golden censer. He's before the altar. He's before the incense. This represents the prayers of the saints going up. This is why they used to do this in the typical system in this, uh, under ceremonial law. They used to have an altar in the temple. They used to have incense. And that's because it represents um, God's people's petitions going up to the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And how does it, how does it work? In reality, this is this is how it's being explained in symbols, but in reality, we have angels that are ascending and descending. This was represented to Jacob as a ladder. And the angels, the good angels, can they can see our petitions, they can see our thoughts and 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 read our heart. And when we're praying, they hear these things and they're going back and forth to heaven and they're communicating these things to the Father and the Son. And there's an unbroken chain of communication between heaven and earth. And this is represented figuratively by Jacob Slatter. It's represented figuratively by in the sanctuary system. Verse 5, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. The point of why we're reading this verse and the point of why it's at this point why it shows up at this part in the Revelation, but under this under the seven trumpets, this is how the seven trumpets open up, is to let us know where Christ is when the seven trumpets begin to unfold. Remember, these things will shortly come to pass, and we see him in the holy place, not in the most holy place. The fall of when when Western Rome collapsed, that was during well, that was when Christ was seated at the right hand of the Father. That was during the time period when they were in, when Christ was in the holy place. This, so this is prior 
1844, that these that the first six of the trumpets are taking place. And so that's why we see Christ here with the golden censer and with the prayers of the saints and before that altar. This is also to give comfort to God's people because, why? Because they were going to be going through the seven trumpets, which are alarms of war, and they would need to know that their prayers are being heard and that Christ was uh, listening and watching over them and hearing them. So this is a very comforting message in a time of gr great calamity and judgment. Okay, now jumping down to verse 7, we read, Three, four, and five, which shows Christ in the sanctuary. Skipping one verse, we are now here with the seven trumpets, and we have the first angel sounding. And it says, The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees were burnt up, and the green grass was burnt up. Now, the part that we want to hone in on to give another witness that this is happening in Rome. Haskell gave one logical argument why we should expect these prophecies to be falling on Rome. Another reason why is this idea of the third part. What does this third part mean? You see this in the trumpets. Uh, I'm going to quote Albert Barnes. Twice, at least, before the Roman Empire became divided permanently into the two parts, the eastern and the western, there was a tripartite division of the empire. The first occurred in 311 AD when it was divided between Constantine, Mycenaeus, and Maximin. The other, 337 AD, on the death of Constantine, when it was divided between his three sons, Constantine, Constance, and Constantinus. That was Albert Barnes. So that's why it's the third part. So when we look to the first trumpet, we can say, oh, is this, is this happening in the northern African sector of the empire? Is this happening in France and Gaul? That was another portion, or is this happening uh, more on the eastern side of the kingdom? Okay, we have Uriah Smith and Josiah Litch, and I'm going to have to, uh, one quote from each of them. The symbols brought to view in Revelation 9 all are agreed in applying to the Saracens and Turks. Now I'm going to quote Josiah Litch, who's getting this information from Keith. And Uriah Smith is getting his view from Josiah Litch, who's getting it all from Keith. So they're both getting it from Keith. And they're both familiar with his work. There is scarcely so uniform an agreement among interpreters concerning any part of the apocalypse as respecting the application of the fifth and sixth trumpets or the first and second woe to the Saracen and Turks. It is so obvious that it can scarcely be misunderstood. Instead of a verse or two designating each, the whole of the ninth chapter of Revelation in equal portions is occupied with a description of both. This is strong evidence that this interpretation is true when so many interpreters from various backgrounds are in agreement on this one point, and it's because the symbols are so clearly delineated. And the Bible explains what locusts are in no uncertain terms. They represent the children of the East. We, we want to look at what's known as the East Wind in the Bible. The East Wind is a symbol for something, and we will, we, we will look at a particular verse here. We want to identify what the East Wind is because it's very important in Bible prophecy. There is a verse in Isaiah chapter 27 which says, He stayeth his rough wind in the day of the East Wind. We want to get at that. So let's first unlock what the east wind represents in Bible prophecy. This will help us moving forward in the study. Okay, the first time the east wind is mentioned, it's mentioned in Genesis chapter 41, verse 27. It's mentioned in a dream. In the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. So east wind, the east wind brought in the judgment of the famine. Exodus 10.13, this is the judgment that's particularly grievous that got Pharaoh to repent that one time, and he had a very hardened heart, and that was the judgment of the locusts. The east wind brought the locusts. And again, that was very 
grievous, sore plague, worse than the others. So the east wind brings in judgment. The east wind also brings in very severe judgments. So when we see when we see this in Bible prophecy, we need to take these things in consideration. We're going to allow the Bible to be its own expositor. We're going to allow one portion of Scripture to shine light on another. And this is very important in the case of the East Wind. It's a very important prophecy. The East Wind carried him away, and he departeth. Job 27, 21. Again, judgment. Next one. Ephraim followed after the East Wind. He daily increaseth lies and desolation. Ephraim was the tribe that was scattered and never to be gathered again. At least in type. The actual biological descendants of Ephraim are no more. They are no longer a people and never will be again a people. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. Again, judgment, captivity, falling by the sword, being scattered about, just as Ephraim was. It's the east wind that does that. I can't think of anything more serious than that, any judgment worse than that, than being depopulated. Here's a really important one. Thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. I'm going to explain that later. That one is really important, just like the east wind brought the locusts is very important. Those are going to factor into Bible prophecy, those verses there. Now, let's compare the east wind with the south and north wind. Just so, just so you can see that the east wind is different. The east wind represents judgment. How thy garments are warm when he quieteth the earth by the south wind. Okay, that sounds very pleasant. I'm envisioning being in some tropical paradise and some warm south wind blowing on me while I drink coconut water out of a straw. How thy garments are warm when he quieteth the earth by the south wind. Next one. And when ye see the south wind below, ye say, there will be heat, and it cometh to pass. So that it, you see, you, see you, have, you have warmth again. And when the south wind, and, and when the south wind blew softly, softly, Luke 12, 55. It's like a, the south wind is a warm breeze. It's wonderful. Okay, north wind, Song of Solomon, awake, O north wind, and come, thou south, blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. North wind brings a pleasant fragrance. It's associated with romance and love. That's a lot different than the east wind. The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a back biting tongue. Let me tell you what I believe this means, and I'm willing to be corrected on this point. I believe what this proverb is speaking of as when somebody is speaking evil, another person gives him a, a look, gives him a frown, and that person shapes up because he reads the expression on that person's face, and he reads it as a rebuke, and so the, back tighted, the backbiting tongue stops. Right. In the same way, we all wish for pleasant days and that there wouldn't be a cloud in the sky. And the north wind drives away the rain so that the sunshine can come and gladden the earth. So I'm interpreting this here as the north wind being being a good thing. So the north wind is a good thing. It brings spices. It drives away the rain. The south wind blows softly and it brings in a, a nice warm feeling. Right, it brings in it brings in a, a nice warm breeze. Now the east wind, you you don't see it being interpreted that way in the Bible. You don't see it being used in that way. You see the east wind bringing desolation and death and famine. There's a difference there, and so when we see the east wind in a, a prophetic verse at the end of the world, we can we know what it means because we have searched through Scripture and we have compared Scripture with Scripture. And we understand the east wind and prophecy. I want to look at Revelation 18.3. And I'm going to explain the ships of Tarshish. I said I would explain it later. 
For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This is the last message of mercy ever to be given to the world. So we have nations being that are drunk. They are not sensible. They are not sober. They have they have lost their ability to reason. And how has this happened? Through the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the wine are the false doctrines and creeds of the apostate churches. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The churches are enforcing their dogma on the people. They can't persuade the people of, of these doctrines and creeds because they're false. So they're going to use the force of the state. They're, you're going to use uh, politics and politically correct speech in order to substantiate their views and hoist their opinions and views on the world. And so that is what it means for the kings of the earth to have committed fornication with her. This is the last message of mercy, again, to be given to the world. And the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. People are getting rich off Babylon. The businessmen are doing well. How did that work in the ancient system? Well, they didn't build world trade centers. They weren't sitting in offices looking at computer screens. They were on ships. And even to this day, most of the world trade is still done at sea. It's still done at ships. They put their stuff in the shipping containers. They drive these ships across the world. Now, thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. The Tarsh, those of Tyre, those of, Tarsh, of Tarshish were the world traders of the day. And so how did God break the rich men, the merchants of the earth, in the ancient world? He broke them with an east wind. Keep that in mind. If we look at this map, we can see, we can see the exodus, we can see the path of uh, the path of the Jews. I assume that this, this is a, a fairly accurate representation of the path that Moses went on. He went eastward, and when he called the locusts, these were the desert locusts that come from the east country. And so you can see where they are located as well and why they're, they're a fitting symbol for the children of the east, for the Arabians. We often read this quote, all the messages given from 1840 to 1844 are to be made forcible now, for there are many people who have lost their bearings. The messages are to go to all the churches. Blessed are the eyes which saw the things that were seen in 1843 and 1844. So there's a time period where the messages were given of God, and they're to be made a test question, they're to be made forcible, and they and it's our responsibility. If we're really following the Lord Jesus, this we believe that this thought here in this verse is coming from heaven. Do we not? And so he's telling us, we have directions. Our commander-in-chief is giving us orders, marching orders, and we are to take these to all the churches, every single one. That is our duty. And we are to make these messages forcible. Now, continuing in the quote, the message was given, and again, it was given by God, and there should be no delay in repeating the message for the times of the signs are fulfilling, the closing work must be done. That's our work. We believe we're Earth's last generation. We believe that those that saw the towers fall, Miss White says Revelation 18, 1 through 3, will be fulfilled when the great buildings in New York fall. And that's the last message of warning ever to be given to the world. It's Earth's last generation that gives the last message of mercy, right? So those that were alive during this period will also be alive to see Christ come in the cloud. And the other signs of the times, the fact that the world is unraveling so quickly and end time events are rapid ones, is a second witness that we truly are living in this era. We're truly living. We truly are Earth's last generation. Okay, the closing work must be done. I'm saying all that because this idea of these messages being forcible, these messages having to go to all the churches, it applies to you and me in a very special way. It's, it's, it's written for us here at the end of the world. We have to do this. This is our work. 
Do you feel the sense of urgency here? A great work will be done in a short time. A message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. This message of judgments in the world, it's going to swell. It's going to grow. And we're able to identify it because we have appreciation for the old light and new light unfolds out of the old light. This is why we're studying things like the trumpets, for instance. And we're looking at Islam and Bible prophecy because it played a very important role in the message from 1840 to 1844. It's, in fact, it's what gave great impetus to the movement, was, was the correct application of the first and second woe. So what I am intimating is that the third woe, the, the doctrine of the third woe, will give this message a push and cause it to swell into a loud cry. The message of the fall of Babylon, as given by the second angel, is repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. So that was early writings, page 277. It's talking about the last message of mercy ever to be given to the world. That's our special message. And it's the it's the it's to let people know that Babylon is falling, but we have additional sins that we're mentioning. A couple uh ones that really jump out would be we are calling for the abolition of abortion, no more child sacrifice. That sin is a deadly sin that's in the United States right now, and the churches are advocating for it and participating in it. And so the, their hands are stained with the blood of little children, and that is child sacrifice. Just, just in the same way, you put your child on the burning hands of Moloch, and you pray to Moloch, uh, you get a blessing, and you give them the child. And people would do that for divine favor or to appease the wrath of the gods. Now, do people do the same thing today? Absolutely. They have a, maybe they want to pursue a career. There's some sort of financial blessing that they're seeking after. And they say, well, this child will inhibit my dreams. And so I am going to sacrifice them. And politicians don't come strongly out in favor of absolute abolition, absolute criminalization of, of, of the children, banning the pills and everything, uh, making exceptions for those that were conceived in rape, punishing the child and not the, the, the rapist. They make exceptions because as a strategy to win office, to win in, to gain seats in Congress. So it's child sacrifice as a strategy to win seats. They don't want to lose the women's vote, right? Because women want to kill the children. And so pro-life is a facade. We're calling for the absolute criminalization, absolute abolition of abortion. So that would be one additional corruption that is coming in the church. Another would be the, 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 the transgender um, movement, all the homosexuality and all the other strange sexual uh, vices that are that are in the church now the sodomite culture that's a, that's very pernicious and it's ubiquitous it's everywhere it's in all the fallen denominations now and you are a fallen church if it's in your church and so we're 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 calling that sin out we're we're calling people out of those those institutions doesn't matter if they have the name baptist or adventist or whatever name they have you cannot be you cannot be supporting you cannot be participating you cannot be giving tithe. You cannot be um, sitting in the pews of churches that are in league with those that are participating in this sin. They're chopping off the breasts of young girls. They're chopping off the genitals of young boys. They're giving them puberty blockers. They're messing with their hormones. They're doing very evil things. So these are the additional corruptions that we need to have a strong stance on, and we need to be calling we need to be pushing pressure even on the kings of the earth for the criminalization of these wicked practices. And if you do not do this, there will be judgments of the most severe kind coming on our countries. So this even affects our well-being as 
well. And in fact, I believe we have to be like Elijah. And if they refuse to criminalize these practices, we need to pray that it would not rain, that God would bring very severe judgments on these countries for doing these wicked things. So do you see the spirit of this message? Do you see how this call out of Babylon is a testing truth and it's very intense and it's it, it goes forth with a great zeal and a lot of religious fervor. Continuing now with the other part of the slide, the message was given. This is the quote that we just read up. We're comparing it now to early writings 277. So you can see that these are companion quotes. The message was given, and there should be no delay in repeating the message. We can see why now, because under the fourth angel, under the loud cry message, the, the call of Babylon is going to be repeated with additional corruptions. And she's saying, in her day, the message was given, we need to repeat this message. Why? A message will soon come by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. And that is the that is actually a that message that will soon come is a message that repeats, but with new um, components to it, new additional corruptions to it, new light unfolds out of it. And so by repeating the old, we are merely disciplining ourselves and training ourselves to be able to receive the new, because again, it, it blossoms out of the old, and we're also helping people to be able to receive the new by, by preaching the old. Those that have no familiarity with the old will have no will not be able to understand or comprehend the new. And those that give up the new, those that give up the third angel's message never really had the first and second angel's message. They just came into the third angel's message, but they didn't have that foundation. This view was given in 1847 when there were but very few of the Advent brethren observing the Sabbath. And of these, but few suppose that its observance was of sufficient, sufficient importance to draw a line between the people of God and unbelievers. Now, the fulfillment of that view is beginning to be seen. Quote, the commencement of the time of trouble here mentioned, this is Miss White speaking now, does not refer to the time when the plague shall begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they are poured out, while Christ is in the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth. The nations will be angry, yet held in check, so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. At that time, the latter rain, or refreshing from the presence of the Lord, will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel. There's really important concepts here in this quote. One part that you see is this idea that the nations are angry, yet they're being held in check. They're being restrained so that the gospel work can finish and all 144,000 can be sealed that they can receive the latter rain and be prepared to go through the seven last plagues. And this is known as, we call this the here, the little time of trouble. That's not a phrase found in the sphere of prophecy, but it's in a very, it's a very good uh, way to describe it because there are, we have two commencements of the time of trouble and she's differentiating. She's differentiating between one where Christ is still in the sanctuary Still keep, still telling the angels, hold, 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 my blood, my blood, my blood, my blood. And there's another one where he's retired from the priestly ministry. The time of mercy has concluded, and he's putting on the garments of vengeance, and the seven last plagues are pouring out. And we call that big time of trouble to differentiate. Now, there's only two possible views there's only two possible opinions for this quote at that time. At that time, the latter rain refreshing from the presence of the Lord. It could fall on Revelation 18, 1 through 3, or it could fall on Revelation 18, 4 through 5. Both encompass the latter rain message. There's two distinct calls. 
that happened under the loud cry of the third angel. One, at, and it's likened to when Christ cleansed the temple of his sacrilegious profanation, once at the beginning of his ministry and once at the end. There's a whole sermon, whole presentation that I've done on this topic, and it's called The Two Distinct Calls. And then you'll find other portions of it in the various other presentations um, on the YouTube channel. And it, it explains just that, that there's two messages that happen under the uh, loud cry of the third angel. This is also, par this, is, this idea is a parallel, not just in Christ's day with him cleansing the temple of the sacrilegious profanation twice, him driving out the money changers twice, him driving out the merchants twice, but also um, we see it in the Millerite day when they gave the second angel's message. And then um, another message came, and that was called the midnight cry, and that empowered the second angel's message. Or maybe a better way to say it would be, maybe a more accurate way to say it was they gave the first and second angel's messages, and then the midnight cry came and empowered the second angel's message. When the quote is saying, and at, and at that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth, the nations will be hangry at hell and check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. At that time, we see that twice, at that time, twice, the latter rain, a refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come and give power to the, to the loud voice of the third angel. This is referring either to Revelation 18, 1 through 3, that was fulfilled, or that began that commenced, Revelation 18, 1 through 3, commenced on September 11, 2001, or it's referring to the second distinct call, when the sins of Babylon reach unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities, that would be when the law of God is made void of legislation at the Sunday law. And it can be only one or two, it can either be the first or the second. It can either be when the great buildings fall in New York, or it can be when the law of God is made void by legislation in Washington, D.C., and so we're trying to understand at that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth. The nations will be angry yet held in check. So let's look at all three quotes now. Let's compare all three quotes together. We have early writings 277. That was the first. The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. Now, this is referring to the first distinct call. This is referring to the 9-11 message in early writings 277. A message will soon, will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. This I believe is also speaking of the message that comes under the under the first distinct call. The reason I say that is because the second distinct call, it is when when the Sunday law arrives, the message is at that swell. Okay, it's the equivalent of the midnight cry. And it helps to think of it this way. You have William Miller and you have Samuel Snow. William Miller preached this message. It caused the greatest revivals that had that have been seen since the Reformation, and that was very, very powerful, and that was very impressive. But when Samuel Snow came and delivered the Midnight Cry, that was so powerful that, that there had been seen nothing like it since the days of the apostolic era, right? So you have Miller, we could say that that's, his message was swelling, 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 building up, building up, building up, building up. By the time Samuel Snow comes and gives the Midnight Cry message, now you've reached the climax. Now you've reached that full swelling. And so there you have the contrast. You have Miller and you have Snow. You have, at the end of the world, the first distinct call, and you have the second distinct call. You could also go back to Christ. You have him at the beginning of his ministry. It builds up, builds up, builds up. And then you have him driving the money changers again out at the second time. And so it's even more powerful the second time. There was... I'm assuming even more righteous indignation the second time you drove out the money changers. So now we see, we see, hey, Miss White has used this concept at that time 
and the refreshing of the presence of the Lord in other quotes before. And we read them. Early writings 277, the angel comes in. This is the mighty angel, comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. And we also read the quotes, hey, make 1840 to 1844 forcible and give that message to all the churches. A message is soon coming by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. So those that are receiving the fourth angel's message, those that are receiving the um, message of 9-11 and Bible prophecy and all that unfolds out of that, and the message of God's judgments have an appreciation for the old. They're able to comprehend this message because they understand the messages from 1840 to 1844. And Miss White does say that the parable of the wise and foolish virgins has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. If you can understand how it has been fulfilled, then you can appreciate how it will be fulfilled under the message that begins or commences um, out from 9-11, just like the parable begins all the way with the virgins going forth after the time of the end. 1798, General Berthier walks in Rome unopposed, the beast suffers its deadly wound, and, the, and that gives rise to um, a movement. Knowledge starts to increase. Likewise, knowledge is increasing in this generation, in the generation that saw the towers fall. The generation before the towers, we can, we can look back and say they really didn't have as much light. I think that's becoming more clear by the day. The world has changed significantly since 9-11. That was the great turning point in world history, both in the nation and in the church. Likewise, I'll say it one more time, Napoleon coming onto the scenes and destroying the Vatican and taking the Pope captive, that changed the world as well, and both in the nation and in the church. So that's a very, very strong parallel there. That's a very, very strong parallel. And so looking at the right-hand side of the screen one more time, when we're talking about the little time of trouble, and at that time, you have the same language at that time, the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord. This is the same, the repressions of the presence of the Lord, the latter rain is the same as a message coming by at God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. The other thing that we want to take hold of is this idea that the, the, the winds, the nations are being held in check at this time. They're very, very angry at this time. I would say that we're here when we look at the conflict in um, Ukraine, when we look at what's going on with between Palestine and Israel. And the, the, it seems as a civil war is gonna break out in the United States. And then we also have in the Pacific theater, China wants to take Taiwan out. We have the rise of the Taliban and we have all these sleeper cells in the United States because of this open border issue that we've had. We have we have terrorists pouring into both Europe and the United States. We are on the verge of a stupendous crisis. The nations are angry, but they're being held in check right now to allow this message to go forth. This is why we really need to get ready and really need to do this, because what we fail to do in a time of peace will have to do in, under very discouraging circumstances. The angel answered, it is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. I put this in here just to show you that these terms are interchangeable. So when we look back on this screen, we can see, hey, this these, these quotes are the same. This is the same subject. When it talks about a message soon coming by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry, and she says, at that time, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come. The swelling into the loud cry is the refreshing from the presence of the Lord. It is the, uh, the, the latter rain. When we see that this mighty angel comes into a right at the right time, and swells to a loud cry. That's the same idea of it being as God's appointment. And it's, again, it's the same idea as the, the um, that, that scene over here talking about the commencement of this time of trouble, which we call the little time of trouble. When are the four winds held in check just prior to the close of probation? When is the time of the latter rain? Zechariah wants us to know because he says, ask me of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. When they actually were dependent upon the rain for their crops in the ancient world, they would pray for the latter rain in the first month when it would come. 
Joel says that the, the former and latter rain, that they come in the first month. And so you wouldn't pray for it in the ninth month. You would pray for it when you're supposed to pray for it. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. Now, let me show you this. This concept that we find in Miss Wright's writing is also in the Bible. Her writings are not some new revelation. It merely just points us back to the old. And we can see that this idea of the nations being angry, held in check during the latter rain season, in, in order for the latter rain to go forth, in order for people, God's people to be sealed, in order for the loud cry of the third angel to be preached, this is actually in the Bible. Uh, Isaiah 27, 6, he shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. These are the, this is the fruits of righteousness. See the book of James, where the husband has long patience for his precious fruit, that his people receive the latter rain. You familiar with this verse? It's the only time that latter rain is used in the New Testament. And that's and that's what he says. It's the rain in Isaiah 55 that causes things to blossom and bud. So Jacob taking root, Jacob blossoming and budding and filling the face of the world with fruit. This is happening because God is bringing a message. This is happening. This development of the fruits of righteousness is happening. And it's happening worldwide. He's filling the whole face of the world with fruit. That's why I have that reference there that says, see Revelation 18.1. Because it's that mighty angel that comes down, that joins in with the third angel, that message, and I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Well, the fruits of the Spirit. Having the fruits of the Spirit is what gives God glory. Having his character reproduce is what gives God's glory. And, and the earth was illuminated. The earth was lightened with the glory of God. Same idea, just different symbols being used. Isaiah 27, 6 is the same prophecy as Revelation 18, 1, but different figures are being employed. Now, skipping one verse to Isaiah 27, verse 8, in measure when it shooteth forth, when everything is blossoming and budding, still talking about the same subject, thou will debate with it. So this issue is going to be stirred up. It's going to be talked about. It's going to be understood. It's going to be debated. He stayeth his rough wind in the day of the east wind. Now this, because of this prophecy, was the whole reason that we took all that time to study the east wind, the north wind, and the south wind. You know what the south wind is. It's a nice, warm, soft wind that's very pleasant. You know what the north wind is. It brings in the, the nice fragrances. And it's a time of romance. It's a, it's a time of love. You know what the east wind is. It's none of that. It is a vicious hardcore, destructive power. It brings in locusts. It sends ships with all their riches and merchandise and gold and silver to the bottom of the sea. It, it caused seven years of famine and destroyed all the crops in the land. And that's what caused the, the, the children of God to be in Egypt, to go to Egypt to flee there. It breaks, it destroys the merchants of the earth and it brings in the it brings in the locusts. Now, the locusts in Bible prophecy are a symbol of Islam. So when we're looking for the restrain, restraining of the rough wind, and the only thing that could be more violent than the east wind, anything, any judge, the only judgment that could be worse than the east wind is the four winds when Michael stands up. Right? That's the only thing. And so he stayeth his rough wind, he re, he keeps back the big time of trouble. In the day of the little time of trouble. When the nations are angry, he holds them back so that his people can be sealed, and he restrains the four winds. He tells them to hold, 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 hold. And when is this happening? This is happening when Israel is blossoming and budding. This is happening during the latter rain season. This is happening when God is giving a message. It's a doctrinal message that he's giving to his people at this time. And it's causing them to reform and to get right with him and to bring forth fruit. This is the latter rain message. This is the refreshing from the presence of the Lord. This is that angel that joins in with the loud cry, right? Remember, that's all the same thing. Refreshing from the presence of the Lord, loud cry, latter rain. And it's the refreshing, it's the rain that causes Israel to blossom and bud. And it's at that time 
that he's saying that he's that the nations are angry, the rough wind is the winds are whipping up at, on on the sea, and he's telling them to hold. He's telling them to hold, but this is happening in the day of the east wind, which is bad. That's why it's the commencement of the time of trouble. That's why it's called that. But she has to differentiate. She's like, hey, there's a there's this time of trouble before the big time of trouble. And here again, I have uh, slides of, of, of the east wind. It brings in the locusts. It causes the famine. It breaks the ships of Tarshish. It breaks the world trades, world traders. Here's 18 MR 63.2. And yet the four winds are held until the servants of our God shall be sealed in their foreheads until I have all 144,000, then I'm going to let the four winds go. So he stayeth his rough wind, he stayeth his four winds in the day of the east wind when these other judgments are happening, but they're mingled with mercy. Entire cities aren't getting wiped out, but there is going to be some select terrorism that's happening. There are going to be some vaccine mandates. There are going to be towers falling. There is going to be wars and in, in certain places in the world. This is this is the time of this is the little time of trouble. This is not the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s when there was relative peace in the world and, and a ton of prosperity. Now we're dealing with inflation. Now we're dealing with open border. Now we're dealing with vaccine mandates. Now we're dealing with the repudiation of the Constitution. Now we're dealing with with uh, some really intense, crazy wars in the Ukraine, in Israel, and China threatening Taiwan, right? There's all these, there's wars, there's rumors of wars. We, we don't even know what to believe. That is not something that people were having concerning themselves with or dealing with prior to 9-11. So we're just further substantiating 9-11 as that pivotal point in history. There's turning points in the nation and the church, and when these crises arrive, the light is given for that time. Okay, Revelation 7, 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. The seal is the commandments of God, specifically the Sabbath truth. The Sabbath truth has the seal of God inscribed in that commandment. It gives his title, his jurisdiction, his name. So that, that's his seal. Revelation 7, 3, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. The nations are held in check in order for the latter rain to go out. In order for the loud cry of the third angel to go out, which is sealing the last of the 144,000. Remember, we were saying the trumpets and how these messages need to be made forcible. Because how can we understand this new light? How can we get this new light without the old light? Well, there's something here in the trumpets that helps us to understand the new message that is here and that it's going to continue to develop and be formalized. Revelation 9 4, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass, neither any green thing neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Very similar language to Revelation chapter 7. That's not by accident. That's by design. There's no coincidences in the Word of God. So you have this idea of, hey, don't hurt anything. Don't hurt those that have the seal of God in their foreheads. And Revelation 17 is saying, hey, don't hurt any green thing. Until we've sealed everybody. Fifth Trump is saying, only hurt those that do not have the seal. Revelation 9 5 says they should not kill them, but they that they should be tormented. So this is the big difference between the fifth and sixth trumpet here. Under the fifth trumpet, there was a tormenting allowed. There was allowed, but not total depopulation, not total destruction, not the total wipeout of the Byzantine Empire, not the total wipeout of Eastern Rome. Only, only stripping them of their territory but not conquering the capital, not taking the whole kingdom. But the sixth trumpet's different. Notice this language, and the four angels were loosed to slay the third part of men. Now we have this uh, concept of the four angels here. Where else was that found? In Revelation 7, that's where we find the, the idea of the four angels. Now they're being loose. Before, under the fifth trumpet, they were being restrained. Don't kill. Don't hurt. 
Don't hurt the green things. Don't hurt innocent things. Don't hurt people that have the seal of God. Only kill those who do not have that. And those are the that's, those are the apostate. That's the apostate church. That's the Eastern Orthodox Church that they were coming against. Kill them. Kill these Trinitarians. That's really what it's. That's really what it boils down to when you look at the doctrine that's underpinning all this. Kill the triune God worshipers. Do not hurt those that have the seal of God in the forehead. Okay, Revelation nine fifteen. By the way, this is actually this actually is an important side note that should be mentioned. According to what has been recorded, the way that they were differentiating between the people, I put in triune God there. That's a that's an inference that I believe can be substantiated. But what's actually recorded in Abu Bakr's decree had to do differentiated between the lifestyle one group was very very reserved they they were living quietly in the country and that's how they were able to identify them they're the quiet people living in the country don't bother them i think this is very very important because when we see these, um, when we when we looked for terrorist attacks in the future, and to those that have already happened, they're going to be they're going to be hitting the cities. We need to get out of the cities. We need to warn people to get out of the cities. So that this is a, that's this is an important part of the message. This is why these messages have to be made forcible, because that which has been is that which shall be, and that which has been done is that which shall be done. And there's no new thing under the sun. The country living message is of great importance. It's a life and death message, actually. Okay, sixth trumpet now. Notice this. It's saying, don't kill in the fifth trumpet. Sixth trumpet, the angels are loose now. They were restrained. Now they're loose. And the four angels were loose to slay the third part of men. But these three, by these three, was the third part of men killed. So now Eastern Rome is falling. By the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone. When you look to the third angel, how is Babylon and the image of the beast being tormented? By fire, smoke, and brimstone. You see that? And do you see that word killed highlighted? They are to kill now. And they took Constantinople under the sixth trumpet. They killed them for sure. And they slayed them. And the Muslims have been holding that part of the world for, 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 for hundreds of years now. Almost, uh, almost a millennia now. So let's build upon that. I've shown you this slide before. We have fifth trumpet restrained. We have sixth trumpet loosed. The four angels are loose. Now I'm going to start on the right hand side because I think this this part here is so very clear and easy to substantiate. So we'll work backwards. We'll we'll, we'll substantiate that which is easiest. So the sixth trumpet unrestrained, four angels loose. Okay, what is the prophetic event that takes us nearest to the point when Michael stands up? The Turk planning his capital in Jerusalem. That's going to signify the big time of trouble. It doesn't happen in that very moment, but there could be a day or two, or maybe just a few hours that separate that time between when Michael stands up and the four angels are let loose and when it actually happens, right? That's clear as day in my mind. Hopefully it's clear as day in your mind too, that we have the sixth trumpet, four angels loosed. And when are the four angels going to be loose in the future? We go, we look to Daniel 11.45. That should be true in your mind beyond a shadow of a doubt. Okay, what about little time of trouble? What about little time of trouble when judgments are in the world, but they're being mingled with mercy? This is when they're restrained. When does that begin? A believer that this, that we are here, that we're already living through the little time of trouble. And whether it be Benghazi or the COVID lockdowns or the massive bailouts, uh, quantitative easing, remember that under Bush and the continued money printing under Obama. And it's gotten really bad under Biden, the lockdowns, the mail-in voting. You, you, you know what I'm getting at there. And then also you have 
the, the border issue. You have all of these issues that are coming here. And 9-11 was the beginning of that. That was the beginning of the Patriot Act, the beginning of the government targeting conservative Christians and undermining the Constitution in a very pivotal and major way. And it begins with an Islamic judgment. It begins, that is the day of the East Wind, right? The ships of Tarshish were, were broken. The World, the World Trade Centers collapsed. That would be just like your prized ships going to the bottom of the sea in the ancient world. And you also have the locusts coming in, right? So we would expect that the day of the East Wind, um, we would expect to see merchants being um, so it had something to do with merchants of the earth, and it had something to do with Islamic terrorism. Also see Amos 7.1 to that, where he sends locusts in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth. So we need we need a we need a day of Arabian terrorists to begin the loud cry season. Amos 7.1 for a proof text of that. Angels are holding the four winds represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction and death in its path. It's represented as a horse. That's an important figure because that is the symbol that's used for the woe under the first and second trumpet dealing with the Saracen and the Turk. So the four winds are holding back an angry horse. Now we know that the sixth trumpet was Turk, the fifth trumpet was Saracen and Turk. And so what is being held back? What, what's what's holding the four winds back? It is the Turk. And what is going to cause the Turk and them to go to war? Well, Daniel 11.45 explains that so very clearly. It's he plants his capital in Jerusalem. He takes back Jerusalem. He was the one that held it before the, before the Jewish state. And then they get it back. And you can see how heated this issue is. I have not seen an issue more heated than this issue. I've not seen an issue that's more confusing or harder to understand than this issue. And you can see why this is causing all the nations to go to Armageddon. Joel chapter 2, verse 4, And the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. And it's because of this, what the horsemen are doing, if you read the chapter, unprecedented judgments are coming upon man. And they blow the trumpet in Zion and they sanctify a fast and call a solemn assembly because of the judgments that are in the land. And they're praying for their own protection against these judgments too. And it's only those that have the seal of God that will be able to withstand what's coming. And what is coming is the East and the West are going to war against each other. This, this Palestinian-Israeli conflict is going to spread is going to spread into Europe and into the United States. We need to study the pouring out of the seventh vial. We, we all need to ask ourselves, have we, been, have we been taking a particular interest in the study of the seventh vial? The Battle of Armageddon. Did you know that most nominal Adventists don't even believe that there's a Battle of Armageddon? They believe that it's some sort of spiritual war that's going on in your mind. They think... All of the stuff, all these signs of the times, that all these signs of the times that are happening daily now, and that we see on our YouTube homepage and on Rumble, what everybody's talking about on the podcast, that that is all just uh, distraction. We see Bible prophecy. Those who have the historical view, those who interpret the prophecies with, with the literal framework, only yielding to a figure when it's absolutely necessary. Those that are studying as William Miller studies and are engaged in giving the third angel's message. They actually see that the nations are going to war against each other, that everybody is about to go kill each other, and that humanity is on the brink of extinction. And Christ coming back to destroy the kingdoms of the earth is, I, I'm seeing it more and more as something that he's doing in mercy. The world is going crazy. The Holy Spirit is withdrawing from the earth. It cannot, it cannot dwell here. It all culminates at the seventh vial. We need to study the pouring out of the seventh vial. The powers of evil will not yield up the conflict without a struggle, but providence has a, a part to act in the battle of Armageddon. When the earth is lightened with the glory of the angel of Revelation 18, the religious elements 
good and evil will awake from slumber and the armies of the living God will take the field. Now, when according to early writings 277, according to that manuscript that we read, and according to that really old um, quote that I think dates back all the way to 1847, early writings 277, let's take particular note at this phrase. I've been putting a lot of emphasis on this phrase. The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. Now, if you were just reading that quote in isolation, you might gloss over that phrase. It might not jump out and take hold of you. But when you're looking at 21 MR 437, it says, this is the quote, again, the context is, all the message from 1840 to 1844 to be made forcible, there to go to all the churches, and the why is given next. The why is a message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. So that idea of God's appointment is the same idea of this message coming in at the right time. Because we know we we know what message it is that ends up swelling into a loud cry. And that is the that is what's called the fourth angel's message. That is the another angel that comes down from heaven and lightens the earth with his glory. So God's appointment is the same as at the right time. And here we have in this quote, speaking of the commencement of the time of trouble, speaking of the little time of trouble, that it's at that time that the nations will be angry yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. And it's at that time that the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come. And the swelling of the loud cry, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord and the latter rain, we already proof text that out to show that Miss White says that they're all in the one and the same thing. That's early writings 271, paragraph two. So if those are all the same things, then at that time is also by God's appointment and also at the right time. And, it's, and it all refers to the Revelation 18 message. And I am, I am submitting to you, my theory to you is that's dealing with the first distinct call and not the second distinct call under the loud cry of the third angel. That's the point that I'm trying to make, and I'm trying to agitate this so that you would study this out and you would determine whether you believe this is talking about the Sunday law or you believe that this is beginning at 9-11. It says when the earth is lightened, it's telling you when, it's telling you this is this is at that time. This is at the right time this angel comes in. This is by God's appointment. It's when the earth is lightened with the glory of the angel of Revelation 18. The religious elements, good and evil, will awake from slumber and the armies of the living God will take the field. It's this message that's in the process of being formulated right now that is causing us to take to the field. 